Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello, my guest is Jonathan Agan. He is the Executive Director for the Max Cure Foundation and is co-founder of the Children's Cancer Therapy Development Institute. He's an attorney who is also a member of the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium's Data and Safety Monitoring Board. He's a consumer reviewer for the Department of Defense's Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program and is a patient advocate at the National Cancer Institute's Brain Malignancy Steering Committee. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. You obviously are very involved in trying to deal with cancer, particularly childhood cancer. And why that's so important to you is because, unfortunately, you lost a daughter at a very young age, 33 months, because of a brain tumor. Can you describe what happened? My daughter, Alexis, was diagnosed when she was 27 months old with a tumor known as diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, or DITG. It is a universally fatal brain cancer that strikes children generally between the ages of five to nine, somewhere around there. Usually children diagnosed with DITG are given nine to 12 months with the best potential treatments available. She was diagnosed in April of 2008. She survived for 33 months. She passed away in January 2011, two weeks shy of her fifth birthday. Obviously, it impacted you so much that you changed your career from working in law, but you are trying to change laws to help people get better treatment to get rid of the toxic chemicals and poisons that are causing the cancer. I'm not a health show, an environmental program, but yet the connection is there. We are seeing more childhood cancers, and is that because we have more toxic chemicals in our environment? The answer is yes, undeniably. Since 1975, there has been a 34 to 35% increase in the number of children diagnosed with cancer. Childhood cancer is the number one cause of death by disease in the United States for children 19 years of age and under. And in most cases, there's no genetic link between a parent and a child who's diagnosed with cancer. So in looking at what accounts for that rise of diagnoses, you have to point to what we're doing to the environment. You have to point to the 80,000 plus chemicals which don't go through the significant testing necessary for better labeling to get them off the market if they're carcinogenic. Stop putting them in consumer products like beds and pajamas and uh, you know everything that we touch on a daily basis. Why do the laws allow such poisons to be in all the consumer products. Good lobbyists. A lot of money that flows into the gymnastics around creating legislation. In my view of looking at, at how to attack this problem from a, a policy standpoint, this isn't necessarily finger pointing. It isn't necessarily saying those who are manufacturing chemicals are awful although there certainly is a component to manufacturing that has not necessarily been as forthright and honest and open as possible. I look at it as an opportunity to create better policies that benefit children, young adults, adults, and that work for the business community as well. And, you know, there's a number of businesses that are supporting the Max Cure Foundation that we can point to that have made the choice to try and, and assist in this endeavor and remove toxic chemicals, help the environment, 
help people who come in contact with chemicals. There are so many different layers to this issue. I get calls from different charities and many organizations wanting money for cancer research. And obviously, if someone has cancer, we want the research to find new treatments, new solutions to make the person healthy. But then there's the other side is if we get rid of what is causing that unhealthy condition, we're in a much better shape. So are these two sides working together, the researchers and the activists trying to stop some of the chemicals from being utilized, or are they really two separate tracks? With respect to the childhood cancer community, and that's the one that I know the best, the answer is the quote-unquote cure community has not necessarily worked with the prevention community and the prevention community has not necessarily been solidified and had an active role to play within this entire framework that we're talking about. When I talk about childhood cancer, I often liken it to a bicycle wheel. And if you look at a bicycle wheel, it has multiple spokes coming out of it and they all emanate from a hub. Well, think of the hub as childhood cancer. And then of the spokes, you've got the care community, prevention, psychosocial care, research funding, drug development, survivorship issues. They all start from that one place. The issue of prevention has not been elevated to the place that it needs to be. Very few research grants are awarded or focused on on prevention, frankly. In looking at trying to bridge this gap, it's not necessarily that they need to be incongruous or it's either or. We need to look at prevention as the ultimate form of cure. And we also need to look at prevention as being able to help with respect to the research as to how to create more durable survivorship within the community. Is the problem greater in the United States because we have so many products with chemicals in them, or do we find a massive problem in the other countries that are more agricultural-based using chemicals in growing food, or is it an issue of technology in general? Are the more technologically advanced countries finding more childhood cancers? Where do we find the bell curve? That's a really good question. I will not claim to be an expert on the current legislation or the policy in other countries, but I do know that in Europe, there's stronger requirements for testing chemicals much stronger than in the U.S. So they do a far better job at ensuring that the chemicals that are put out in consumer products are put out in the the stream of, of consumers, so to speak. Here, not so much. Again, I think you've got to go back to the fact that there is a very active lobby. Everything has a lobby for it. And chemical producers and the folks who are putting them out in the, the consumer stream are spending a tremendous amount of money to maintain that. You are a lobbyist, so to speak, for patients. You're a patient advocate. What do you do with the National Cancer Institute's Brain Malignancy Steering Committee? So that role, I'm in my second three-year term with the Brain Malignancy Steering Committee. Essentially, the committee is made up of about 30 or so members, two patient advocates, one on the pediatric side, one on the adult side, and we review and analyze generally phase two or phase three clinical trials to either approve or deny funding and operation through the National Cancer Institute. Why does the Department of Defense have a congressionally directed medical research program? You're the consumer reviewer. So that actually is another phenomenal program, and it's been a great way for the childhood cancer community and breast cancer community and many other disease populations to obtain additional research funding. The congressionally directed medical research program is just that. It is a pool of money that is set aside by Congress out of the budget that is up for award to medical researchers 
to specifically study, again, like brain cancer or other forms of childhood cancer or breast cancer. There is a study section within the CDMRP for Gulf War illness. It provides another avenue for the awarding of research funding. As a member of the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium's Data and Safety Monitoring Board, what exactly are you monitoring? Where? What? That is a very new appointment. When a clinical trial is being run, you have to monitor safety incidents and you have to monitor the patients that are on them. Everything is de-identified and you monitor various events that occur during the course of administration of clinical trial drugs and therapies. You are executive director of the Max Cure Foundation. Why that name? The Max Cure Foundation was named after Max Plotkin, who was diagnosed with a very rare form of lymphoma, B-cell lymphoma of the bone back in 2007. He was treated at Sloan Kettering, and he was the very first pediatric patient ever seen there with B-cell lymphoma of the bone. During the course of his treatment, his father, David Plotkin, and grandfather, Richard Plotkin, really saw a lot of inequities with respect to the access to treatment, research funding, things that really touched them deeply. And so in 2008, they formed the Max Cure Foundation to fund research and to financially support low-income families that had a child undergoing treatment. Max is thankfully a survivor, so his story is a happy one, and uh, he'll be going off to college in a year. Why did you found the Children's Cancer Therapy Development Institute. Now, this is a nonprofit childhood cancer research biotech located in Oregon, although your Max Cure Foundation is located in New York. But there seems to be so many institutes, so many organizations dealing with cancer. It's overwhelming. Why did you start another one? It is. And each of them has a role to play, although there is a lot of duplicative effort going on, which is something that is very important to me as the executive director of the Mexico Foundation to cut through that. After Alexis died in January of 2011, I got back into the practice of law. I had no passion for it whatsoever at that time. Fast forward to 2013 in November, and I was invited to attend a meeting out in San Francisco talking about increasing collaborative efforts between regulators and researchers and funding organizations and advocates for brain cancer. And at that meeting, I struck a conversation with a researcher who was out in Oregon. Since that time in November 2013, the conversation just progressed. He started to lay out his vision for a standalone nonprofit research facility specifically focused on childhood cancer. Because most research is done at academic institutions, there's issues with respect to translation from a lot of the research that gets funded to the clinic. One thing led to another, and we founded CCTDI, which was, uh, for short, Children's Cancer Therapy Development Institute, as a way to accelerate research into some of the more recalcitrant forms of childhood cancer to create a new model that was not focused on academic papers. Now that people are aware that chemicals in our products, in our environment, are causing health problems, are we getting enough laws on the books and regulators to make sure that that problem gets reduced. Is there one piece of legislation or law that needs to be strengthened to improve the situation so that we don't have so many toxic chemicals in our products and environment? We have to call for stronger testing. We have to call for stronger regulations that require every single chemical to go through a battery of of tests to create a, a safety profile and to ensure that consumer products are free from the most carcinogenic chemicals out there. You can look for lists on the internet that are curated by a number of different organizations that put all the chemicals out there that are known carcinogens, suspected carcinogens. The problem is that in most instances, They're not required to test them. If I could point to one area that we're falling down miserably, it's in testing. We all assume that these chemicals are tested before they get out there. This is really 
rather shocking news to hear that it's not required. It shocked me. And I'm really in my infancy with respect to focusing on the issue of prevention and looking at toxic chemicals and the environment and their interplay between the rise of diagnoses of children with cancer. I wish we had time to hear about all the new research and studies going on, but I also wish we had time to talk about all 80,000 chemicals that are dangerous to us and we don't. Is there one particular chemical that's doing the worst, causing the most health problems, one that we need to get out of our environment? I don't necessarily know that I can pull one chemical out. Too many, uh, huh? There are. And with this childhood cancer prevention initiative that the Max Cure Foundation launched with a number of other organizations, including the American Sustainable Business Council and so many other Cancer Free Economy, so many other amazing organizations. We really are starting to pull the, the curtains back and show that there is, in fact, a link between these chemicals that we truly don't know much about and the rise in pediatric cancer. There's science, there's evidence, the numbers aren't lying. These chemicals are changing genetic structures. They're impacting children later on in life due to exposures. It really is an effort to not only bring awareness to the fact that chemicals and the environment are increasing the number of children being diagnosed with cancer, as I said before, 34 to 35 percent since 1975, but more importantly, to bring the conversation to the business community and other sectors that we can all discuss the issues and look for solutions, including you know, supporting green businesses and creating legislation which forces more testing, forces more awareness and, and openness. I'm so glad that you are making us aware of the problem and trying to find those solutions. I want to wish you well in your efforts in that regard, and I'm very pleased that you have three healthy children and that we continue the work to try and make all children and adults safe from toxic chemicals. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you very much. Together we can. I have been speaking with Jonathan Agan, who is the Executive Director of the Max Cure Foundation. I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310 310- Five five nine nine one six zero. Environmental Directions with your host Nancy Perlman is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.